Hello and welcome to video four of the book Charlotte's Web. We are reading the chapter book Charlotte's Web by author E.B. White with pictures by Garth Williams. I've already made three other videos and I hope if you have not watched those yet that you will go back and do so. This video is video number four in the series and we are reading chapter six and chapter seven. As we read chapter six of Charlotte's Web, I would like for you to be thinking about why don't the geese trust the rat? So in this story, there's a goose, more than one goose, there's geese, and there's a rat. And the geese don't trust the rat, and we're gonna think about why. We're also gonna look at these three vocabulary words as we read. Untenable, which means not fit to be lived in. A lair, which is the den of a wild animal an interlude, which is a short break or pause. So be sure and listen for untenable, layer, and interlude as we read. Chapter six, Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs, and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends, and the children have time to play and to fish for trouts in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you can hear the rattle of the machine as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar in long green swaths. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake and pitch and load and the hay would be hauled to the barn in the high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding at the top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of timothy and clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in, and sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds in the fields, around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere, love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls, oh, Peabody, 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 on an apple bough. The Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, Sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. Do you remember what an interlude is? An interlude is a short break or pause. If you enter the barn, the swallows sweep down and down from their nests. Cheeky, cheeky, they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The Frigidaire is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk. If you poke it apart, it has a green worm inside it. And on the underside of the leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bug. 
It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there, sitting on her stool, when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had arrived. So what are goslings? They're what they call the baby geese that are hatching out of the goose eggs. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were in a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite so she sat quite still and talked less than usual. When the first goslings poked its green gray gray green head through the go goose's feather and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she is now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations? Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck has nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from the hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked or trusted. Look, he began in his sharp voice. You say you have seven goslings? There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton, if I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened his strong wings and beat the air with them to show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton. Remember, we're listening for why don't the geese trust the rat. So now we've read that the geese don't trust the rat, and let's find out why. And with good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feeling, no friendliness, no nothing. He would kill a gosling if he could get away with it. And the goose knew that. Everybody knew it. So why were they worried about the rat? Why did the, why don't the geese trust the rat? It's because the rat had no morals no decency, no friendliness, and if he could get away with it, what would he do? Oh no. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest. So they're giving him one egg, the egg that did not hatch, that doesn't have a baby in it but they're worried 
about what he might do to their other babies that did hatch. And the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. But my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. Do you remember what untenable means? Untenable means not fit to be lived in. Why would the egg breaking make the rat uh, make the barn untenable? Let's read. I think Charlotte will explain it. What's that mean? asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till the, he succeeded in rolling it to his lair under the trough. Do you remember what lair means? Lair is the den of a wild animal. In this case, it's the den of Templeton the rat. It's his home. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings off the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came with Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now isn't that lovely? Now we're going to read chapter seven, bad news. Wonder what the bad news will be. As we read chapter seven, I want you to listen for two vocabulary words. Hysterics is one of the words we're gonna be listening for. Hysterics means a fit of uncontrollable laughter or weeping. And anesthetic. Anesthetic is a substance that produces a loss of feeling. So as we read, we're going to read chapter 7. We're going to listen for hysterics and anesthetic. We're also going to listen for when Charlotte promises to save Wilbur. Do you think a spider will be able to do so? So let's listen for where Charlotte promises that she'll save Wilbur. I wonder what she's going to save him from. And then find out if you, the reader, believes that the spider will be able to save the pig. Be sure and listen for hysterics and anesthetic in chapter seven. Bad news. Wilbur liked Charlotte better and better each day. Her campaign against insects seemed sensible and useful. Hardly anybody around the farm had a good word to say for a fly. Flies spent their time pestering others. The cows hated them. The horses detested them. The sheep loathed them. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were always complaining about them and putting up screens. Wilbur admired the way Charlotte managed. He was particularly glad that she was always put her victim to sleep before eating it. It's real thoughtful of you to do that, Charlotte, he said. Yes, she replied in her sweet musical voice. I always give them an anesthetic so they won't feel the pain. It's a little service I throw in. Did you hear our word anesthetic? It's so they won't feel the pain. It's a, a substance like medicine that produces a loss of feeling so they can't feel her sucking their blood out. As the days went by, Wilbur grew and grew 
He ate three big meals a day. He spent long hours lying on his side, half asleep, dreaming pleasant dreams. He enjoyed good health, and he gained a lot of weight. One afternoon, when Fern was sitting on her stool, the oldest sheep walked into the barn and stopped to pay a call on Wilbur. Hello, she said. Seems to me you're putting on weight. Yes, I guess I am replied Wilbur. At my age, it's a good idea to just keep gaining. Just the same, I don't envy you, said the old sheep. You know why they're fattening you up, don't you? No, said Wilbur. Well, I don't like to spread bad news, said the sheep. But they're fattening you up because they're going to kill you. That's why. They're going to what? Screamed Wilbur. Fern grew rigid on her stool. Kill you. Turn you into smoked bacon and ham, continued the old sheep. Almost all young pigs get murdered by the farmer as soon as the real cold weather sets in. There's a regular conspiracy around here to kill you at Christmas time. Everybody's in on the plot. Lurvy, Zuckerman, and even John Arbel. Mr. Arbel, sobbed Wilbur. Fern's father? Certainly. When the pig is to be butchered, everybody helps. I'm an old sheep, and I see the same thing. Same old business, year after year. Arbel arrives with his 22 shoots the stop screamed Wilbur I don't want to die save me somebody save me Fern was just about to jump up when a voice was heard be quiet Wilbur said Charlotte who had been listening to this awful conversation I can't screamed Wilbur, racing up and down. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to die. Is it true what the old sheep says, Charlotte? Is it true they are going to kill me when the cold weather comes? Well, said the spider, plucking thoughtfully at her web. The old sheep has been around the barn a long time. She has seen many a spring pig come and go. If she says they plan to kill you, I'm sure it's true. It's also the dirtiest trick I have ever heard of. What people don't think of. Wilbur burst into tears. I don't want to die, he moaned. I want to stay alive right here in my comfortable manure pile with all my friends. I want to breathe the beautiful air and lie in the beautiful sun. You're certainly making a beautiful noise, snapped the old sheep. I don't want to die, screamed Wilbur, throwing himself to the ground. You shall not die, said Charlotte briskly. What? Really? cried Wilbur. Who's going to save me? I am, said Charlotte. How? asked Wilbur. That remains to be seen, but I am going to save you, and I want you to quiet down immediately. You're carrying on in a childish way. Stop your crying. I can't stand hysterics. Did you hear the word hysterics? Hysterics is an uncontrollable fit of laughter or weeping. Certainly weeping and unhappiness in this case. Also, when Charlotte promises to save Wilbur, as we just heard, do you, the reader, think that a spider will be able to save Wilbur? 
Well, make your prediction and come back for video five to find out if Charlotte is able to save Wilbur. Thank you for reading chapter six and seven with us, and we will see you on the next video for chapter eight of Charlotte's Web by E.B. White with pictures by Garth Williams.